primary thing about me is I have a lot of cool people supporting me and some of them are sitting there uh, pretending to not be here and smoking shisha, <laughs> uh, but I think tonight we'll hear a lot about uh, people who I actually work with, and it's basically it's not me. I'm just probably lucky to be in the right position with the right people around me. Uh, some of them are actually sitting in the back there, our HR team. They prepared today everything while doing their own job. So I think before I start talking about myself, it would be cool to give them a. a It really came last, like last minute. I told him like I think two days ago, uh, startup grind is going to be here. It was my fault. I should have known before. Emmanuel did a great job on camera. He did a great job before telling us. But uh, I told him last minute, and I think he did a really cool job to prepare everything and have good food. It doesn't always like we don't get this treatment all the time. <laughs> um, but maybe a bit about me. Um, I was born in Iran. Um, actually uh, during war with Iran, Iraq war and I guess that kind of already influenced a lot of my path and maybe also the energy like, like it influenced me in a way and then when I was seven I came to, uh, to Aachen and um, I was lucky to I think to grow up in Aachen which is a really for me personally really a cool place to grow up and to go to school with and a lot of these guys I know from back in the days when we were little boys. Um, after that uh, I went to the best school, the best high school in Aachen which is uh, Kuven. I don't know if you guys are from Aachen but if anyone tells you <laughs> Kuven is not the best school they're lying. Um, after that I, um, I actually, actually during that time I met um, one of my co-founders and some of the founding team, um, Bachmann, he's not here today, but we met during, like we played basketball together, okay. and um, it was a time during high school where we basically started to, we somehow had this feeling of we want to create something. Yeah? I don't know what it was, I don't know where it came from, but we started to do, I started to learn HTML and code, um, and he was very good with computers, so we thought, okay, we're gonna sell to every company in Aachen, we're gonna sell a website. And back then, not so many companies had a website. We tried that, it didn't really work. Um, we uh, then had a really brilliant idea, we just prepare the website before we sell it to them. So we just say, hey, click there, your website's already finished, just give us some money for it. Uh, that kind of worked, but this taught us, I think, kind of how to work together and entrepreneurship and how do you actually maybe make some money and those were the first steps us as partners and us as entrepreneurs trying to sell a product and it felt for us very uh, very fulfilling kind of so that we both always thought okay we actually want to do something uh, we don't know what but somehow it didn't really matter what exactly it is as long as we can create something feels like the right thing we get the it gives us strength it felt like it's our strength and um, we increased that and we did some he went into art direction and um, films and so we started with uh, producing music clips and producing small image videos during high school times and trying to sell it to people so so when was that in terms it's of uh, years years quite old now I think <laughs> like 18 years ago okay yeah. so about eight years before uh, the major yes, exactly yeah. so around eight years before before Navawi we started with the first ideas most of them kind of failed uh, but we had a lot of we had a great time and um, we learned a lot of things I think. so we made that a bit bigger and um, we made actually um, our first movie our current uh, some of the guys here and some of the Senior tech, I see Babak in the back there. Uh, they were part of this first movie. It was a first cinema movie, so our first big uh, thing to do. We had no money, and we wanted to shoot a 90-minute cinema movie. Um, so we had to somehow find money, right? So this is basically what an entrepreneur does, right? So find money somewhere, create a product that everyone knows. Um, it somehow turned out well because we had like 
for three or four months around 50 people working for free for us while we wrote every company in Aachen and said, hey, we can place your product in it. And we found like some, like some vodka parliament and like crazy people from around Germany. And I think the Armin Laschet was like the Schirm here and we somehow made it like as a cool project. And it confirmed for us that we want to create something. And then from there on, um, uh, Babak and Bachmann, they experiment with a lot of like uh, little projects or some bigger projects and uh, some of us went towards like study like let's go to university and maybe we learn something there so we don't make so many mistakes um, I went to uh, Maastricht which is not far from here um, again being followed by a lot of the guys that I've met in high school and played basketball with um, and during those times we kind of increased our entrepreneurial engagements and we failed a lot of the, we failed all the time yeah? uh, but it was fun uh, then um, what, what do you mean by failed we just tried projects that were not really successful because we, the idea was stupid or the team was not right or we didn't have money uh, so one idea I worked with uh, actually one of them got really really uh, big now is one of them is so actually Mathieu and Ia and me we helped the founder the current founder of Rebel Comedy, that some of you might know, but they've become quite big in Germany. Uh, but back in the days, he had this vision of, hey, let's make a stand-up comedy, uh, or let's make comedy for just for people like us. Yeah, and we were like a bunch of diverse group of people. And back then, he had this vision, and we kind of helped him along the way. At the beginning, we found Vanessa, who is now like all over the TV channels. And uh, that was the start. We didn't really, afterwards we didn't have anything to do with that, so all the props goes to him. But So we tried ideas like this, and uh, I had like a, another company, it was called Fubaku. We tried to bring a football community, fans together with, we wanted to bring like the superstars into this community so that the fans can communicate with the superstars, um, which turned out to be a stupid idea. Um, but, it was during university times we were basically just testing all these things that we were reading. Like what does this actually mean, management theory, and what does it mean, VC, uh, venture capital, and getting money. And um, they, none of them really worked. Um, then afterwards I went to do my MBA in Holland and in America. And during those times, um, Bachmann was on the side experimenting with several e-commerce ideas. and. On the side, he was like selling his aunt's clothes. She had a boutique here in Aachen, and uh, he just basically helped her to put it online on eBay. And it got really like some of the stuff got sold out immediately. And uh, there was him and Babak were pushing this idea a lot, and Babak coded like was starting to code the first shop, and maybe that was something. And then he approached me, and we discussed it, and we looked at the numbers, and we're like, okay, wow. Actually, customers from Australia are paying 100 euros for a dress that is that costs 100 euros. They pay 100 euros shipping to have a dress that costs 100 euros. And then she emails us and says, thank you very much, you have changed my life. I can finally express myself. Uh, you've given me this language fashion back. I can express my identity. I'm like, huh? okay, that's very extreme. And then this feedback, they came on, like more and more, every day more of this feedback came. So we drilled into the numbers together and we saw, okay, actually from this boutique, it's actually only the plus size part and more the premium plus size part that is actually selling globally. So let's dig deeper, maybe there is something. Uh, so we dug a bit deeper and we saw, okay, that's very odd. There's no one in Germany selling plus size clothes in premium-ish segment. There's only really cheap stuff. And then we looked in Europe, and okay, there's no one in Europe selling this. Then we looked globally, and like, okay, this doesn't make sense. No one globally is selling this. But these customers, they're sending us from all over the world these feedbacks, this doesn't make sense, right? So you have like on the one hand, the customer who actually pays for it saying, I love you, please continue, you're changing my life. And on the other hand, you have like no one offering to them. And in, I don't know who of you guys uh, studies management, but one of the first things you learn is usually if there is no competition, there is no market, right? 
So we went like with this assumption and like, okay, maybe we're just fantasizing. So we talked to some industry ex experts, also venture capitalists, and they told us, guys, there is no market, plus size women, and I quote, yeah, these are not my words, I quote, plus size women are fat and lazy and they don't have money and they don't want fashion, they, they just don't care for it, so give it up, yeah? Um, this was a, actually a very, very famous German VC that is today very active. Um, and they were like, okay, this doesn't make sense. And meanwhile, uh, Babak and Bachmann were also like putting a lot of time into this. And on the other hand, like we saw, okay, crazy, this customers are telling us we want this. The experts are telling us this is stupid. So why are we just, let's just give it, give it a shot, right? And if this giving a shot, I think it sounds easy, but it's, it's kind of like you make life decisions, right? Like for me, it was like, okay, after my MBA, do I go into consulting or do I just like decide for not earning money and start a company where everyone says, don't do it, right? So these are the decisions you kind of have to make along the way. And for Bachmann, it was also a lot connected with financial responsibilities. Like, do I take this loan, uh, try this experiment, although everyone is telling me um, this is stupid, right? And usually there are like two sides and you one says, don't do it, don't do it. If you listen to your mom, likely you will tend towards not doing it. Uh, no offense, yeah, but like at least my mom, she was like, yes, go and earn money. And, um, but we still decided to give it a shot. So we took everything we had, all the time, resources, and we found it Navabi. And within the first year, it was already profitable. And we were making like, I don't know, a million or something. And that was 2010? This is 2009. 2009. Yes. So officially, it went online April 2009, the website. It was founded before, um, but this was like end of 2009. So we were, we had numbers, we had great, like customers loved us, all the KPIs were great. So we had like the basis of, okay, now we're gonna prove them all wrong and go to VCs. Actually, there was a time where VCs came to us and they said like, hey, this is a really great idea, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is the start of Navabi basically a lot of luck, a lot of great people supporting this project, a lot of people sacrificing their time and energy for just taking the risk, although in the past we had failed many times. So in a way you could uh, you could even say that you started with the feedback, so normally you try to, to mm -hmm. have an idea and then you go out there and collect the feedback as much as you can get, mm -hmm. but you kind of started with the feedback and were like, okay, this this seems to be a thing, let's, mm -hmm. let's go there and, and mm -hmm. try it out. Yes, in a way, yes. I think it started before the feedback because people put energy into doing something, right? And that thing generated feedback. And then I guess we were just lucky and smart maybe at some points to take this feedback and dig deeper and look at the market situation. Yeah, kind of because of the feedback. Exactly, because yeah. of the feedback. We kind of listened to what are they telling us. But also depends on which feedback because the VCs were telling us the feedback of the VCs was don't do it, it's a waste of time. I heard some guys in San Francisco saying that uh, you have to get some no's mm -hmm. before you uh, before you realize that you're on the right path. Yes, very much. Yeah. I fully agree to that. And up to today, this is probably the one thing that we are trying to get right, but it's very difficult to understand what this feedback actually means for your decisions. Yeah. Cool. Very interesting. So to sum this up, you kind of always wanted to to entrepreneur stuff. Mm -hmm. And I had, a, I had an idea of, yeah, you don't really have an idea. It's more like, um, I just want to do stuff on my own and make mm -hmm. it big. Exactly. You didn't really, that, that's the point. So it's not, it, it's more like you, you've been an entrepreneur mm -hmm. the whole time. Mm -hmm. And then you tried out, you tried out again and again yeah. over yes, yes. eight years yes. until you were like, okay, this is, this is finally kicking off. Yes, exactly. So I think for us it was two things. One was the urge or this Somewhere, oh, danke. You said unglaublich. Can I see now? Thank you. Somehow you have to have this urge of creating something. Um, I think everyone, if they would listen to themselves, they have some somewhere a passion, which they would love to follow, but sometimes it's difficult. One and the second thing for for me personally was I always wanted to create something with friends. So this like. It's my friends that were involved, Babak, Mathieu, and Ia that are all sitting here. Um, 
and Bahman especially, they gave me this energy to do this, right? So I felt always with this group of founders, I, I can conquer the world, like, it doesn't matter if it goes up or down, it will feel right. So this was the second point. Yeah, that gets me to an interesting topic because you um, told me before that there are a lot of friends and even some family members uh, working in the company and uh, that that can be tricky sometimes and I, I could imagine yes. that it's still that it's still tricky, right? It is very tricky. So I think in some, if you get it right, it will be one million percent more fun and you will feel much more love and life will be better when you get it right. Um, but of course, so because you have a lot of things, you are, so I go to work, I love going to work, I know I'm going to see my best friends at work. It kind of feels like vacation every time I go to work, right? So I think if I compare this to what my fiance tells me about her work, it's uh, like, wow, I, if I would never do what you do. Like, I cannot go to a work where I don't like the people, right? So it has this advantage where you know, okay, there's this, there's this loyalty, there is this trust, like even if there are hard times, and there are many, many hard times on your path, if you have a group of people that will support you, you will, somehow you will feel like you will always make it, right? This is, a, this is the pro. The con is if you are a friend, usually what you tend to do is you don't give each other real feedback because you kind of think, ah, if I tell him this, our friendship, you know, like, cannot talk about this. I cannot tell him he's not performing good because, hey, this is my friend. We're going to drink, I don't know, gin tonic afterwards, right? So this is like the part where you actually, over time, you understand, oh, wow. Actually, if you take this formula and turn it around, you say, because he's my friend, I need to be 100% honest and have a really good communication with him because he, he knows I have good intentions. He knows I love him or her. Uh, Let's use this bond to actually communicate mm. even the tough things. So really practice this uh, tough love mentality. This can turn into, a, this can turn in theory into something very, very positive, but in practice it's much more complicated. Right? I guess, so there have been major step backs. Mm. I wouldn't call it step backs. I think it's always learnings for us, yeah, kind of. Because um, sometimes you, friends or family, you sometimes also, there's this saying which sometimes when we have like this meetings with the venture capitalists or with other founders, there's always uh, this killing your darlings, they call it, yeah? So in the life of an entrepreneur, when your company grows, sometimes there will be people with you in your company that have been there from day one, but their learning curve and their situation in life is just different to what the company needs, yeah? There's nothing bad or positive about this, it's just that it's different. Yeah. Maybe they got now a family and they want to invest less into growing personally, uh, but this makes them still much more happy. Yeah, maybe it's like that, or maybe other reasons, you never know. But in many companies and many founders will witness this killing your darling effect, because you won't kill your darlings and this will actually hurt everyone else. Um, and killing your darling is super difficult because of the friendship part, right? So the only way this can work is if both parties are aware of the responsibilities that they have. And like, okay, the company wants to grow 100%, this means I personally have to grow this year 200%. How else can I pull up the company, right? Otherwise, if I don't grow personally 100%, I grow 10%, I am pulling the company down, right? So if you are aware of this and what it means, and you are 100% honest to you and your team, it will work. If not, and most of the time, you are not reflective enough of that because you just don't have the time. You're in the day-to-day, then you will likely have a lot of frustrations. And I, I guess so, yeah. I can imagine that going downhill. Mm. Absolutely. Very much. So it's are there like special, like, like, yeah, I guess it's, it's the honesty, it's the, it's the, the, the try to, uh, to, to have the best communication, to, to tell them what's going on and, and reflect with them together. Mm -hmm. Yes, very much. And it's very difficult because you need to, this tough love mentality basically means you have to know, you have to go into a meeting being very aware of your intentions. And usually if your intentions are good, the outcome will be good. Yeah? If you just talk 100% real what you mean, right? what you want to say, like, hey, form's not good, you're not delivering on time, 
Yeah. Uh, it's difficult to say that to friends or family. And I think with friends it's a bit easier, especially if you grow up in the same culture and with the same mentality, it will be easier. But if it's like family, it will be, and if it, let's say that it's a generation gap, the way of thinking will be difficult. So there it's even more tricky, right? Because then it, you have implications also at home with other family members, etc. So that's very, very difficult. If you get it right, perfect. So jumping from, from one family uh, and, and friendship part to the other, how much family and friendship do you need in an investor? Oh, so what's wow. the, I mean, what, what's the stories with your VCs? And yes. is, it, is it that you, you kind of try to make them friends too? Or is it just a money business? Oh, wow. <laughs> So uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I think to give you a one sentence answer would be never work with a VC, yeah? Okay. If you want friends, yeah? <laughs> like in brackets. Uh, if you can make it without VCs, even better, yeah? Okay, to, to shorten that um, or to extend that, it's you only worked with VCs or are there also business angels and maybe no. private investors? No, we, we jumped from, uh, so we, kind of had our first round uh, directly with uh, Dumont, which is now Capnemic. Some of you might know it. It was Jörg Binnenbrücker, who was the first investor in Navabi. We were lucky enough that from a scale from like all VCs in Europe, I think he's more towards, or he's the guy, if at all you can call someone. Like he's really a friend. Okay. Yeah, as, as much as it's possible, because he has his own responsibilities and duties, etc. right? Um, as long as you understand that their job is basically to buy you cheap and sell you high, mm -hmm. and you don't have this illusion of, hey, my friend, <laughs> right? Uh, this, is, this comes secondary. The responsibility is they get, but it's, it's nothing bad. It's not that they are evil or something. If you think about it uh, very w without emotions, each one of you and your parents and gra uh, grandparents, one thing that we all try to do is to, let's say, save some money to invest it somewhere. Yeah? So VCs are basically investing the money of hard-earned money of other people. Yeah? This is of, could be of anyone's grandparent. Yeah? Their job is to take this money and invest it in the best way so that their grandparent can have their retirement money. Right? This is their job. If you look at it from that point, you understand that no matter how ruthless you <coughs> might feel their decisions is, they're actually optimizing for the for the masses. They have to do it, right? But this means also they looking at the masses. They are uh, they are positive and friendly, but maybe not for the individual where they invest in. Yeah. Okay. I see but yeah, you should not seek like this. This guy won't become your best friend because he has a duty. Of course. Um, but I heard so many stories about um, business angels and smaller private investors who are like got bonded with the team and yes. really supported them over yes. a long period yes. and got VCs together with them and everything. Yes. But yes. it isn't really... Uh, um, the, the, the sorry, if I, maybe if I didn't express myself correct. So all our VCs are super good. All of them are very helpful. Yeah? Uh, and with many of them we are on a... <laughs> action. Yes. With many of them, or with all, we are on a very, very friendly term. And like guys like Jörg Winbrücke or the Index, uh, Dom Vidal and Stefan from Verdain, they, it feels like buddies because they're supporting us each way, even in hard times, right? So we are lucky there, but it is different than when I go and I'm seeking out friendship. Mm -hmm. So maybe I didn't express it the correct way, but yes, they are friendly, they, are com they support us to the max they can, but they have a responsibility that is higher than the individual company. Sure. Money. Yeah, or consciously <coughs> consciously managing the money of other people, right? Because it's not their money. They're managing it for the grandparents and the parents of us. And it's not their money. So um, when, when did you get in contact with the, after starting the company? Like how many years did it take to, to get the first uh, VC? Mm -hmm. So when, we, when I joined, I think during the MBA, we already tried to approach VCs. One thing that we did, which I would always recommend people to do is to look at your alumni of your university and just see which of my alumni works in which you see uh, and just send them an email. That's what we did. We sent lots of emails. Um, and it was in 2009, I think, beginning 2010. 
we met them, they said, ah, uh, these five things are not good, come back when, when, you, when you got it right. When you got it right. We really worked then on these five things. We were really lucky that, uh, in this case, your Bündnerger saw in us a lot of potential and um, was very, very supportive. And that's the beginning. Uh, so he invested in us. And then a year later, uh, Seven Ventures invested in us from, uh, from France. And then a year later, Index Ventures, which is like one of the biggest funds in the world, they invested in us. And then recently we had uh, Verdain from Scandinavia, really, really cool guys. Um, and uh, it's undisclosed, but for him also mm -hmm. recently. So it's like a whole path, long path of meeting a lot of VCs and pitching. And how, how does this um, VC, um, the pitching the VCs kind of works? Did you, did you take your whole team um, because I, I, I think the, the team is very important for the VCs. They are like, yes. okay, the idea is nice, but like, do I believe those guys can pull it off? Yes, exactly. So how, what's, uh, what was your presentation? Oh, wow. uh, how we, many people? we were two hours late. Uh, Bachmann <laughs> and me had an appointment with Jörg and we came two hours late. Uh, that was already like kind of okay. It's not <laughs> <laughs> but it was usually, uh, so in all the finance, financial rounds, it was always Bachmann and me. And uh, we presented a deck of slides going from like, why this idea, what's the problem, what's our solution, what's the team that can actually operationalize the solution, and where's the vision behind this, yeah, why, why is it meaningful? It's kind of one of your best friends, right? So mm -hmm. you, you were a compact team in front of the yes. jury, kind yes. of, and then... I think you can then feel, when you're good with your co-founder or team, they will feel it. Yeah. They will know if this is... For example, in the index round, we had a uh, we thought we need a CFO to go and pitch to index. There was a new guy which we were not really yet friendly with. We took him with us. We thought, okay, cool. He's he is like he was like I don't know VP of Merrill Lynch or something was before. We thought, okay, he has really cool credentials. They're gonna invest in us because of him. And then later on, Dom told us actually the one reason I didn't want to invest in you guys was because I saw this chemistry between you two and the CFO who was like. Okay. Somehow not part of this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can, I can see that. Yeah. Um, okay. So you got the investments, and um, when, when was the, the uh, or there was a point when, when you were like, okay, this is a business which is, which is actually working. So we got mm -hmm. money from somewhere else, but it's still, it's, it's gotta be still at a point where everybody is like, I don't know if this is gonna shoot out or not. Mm -hmm. So. When was the, the, the breaking even point when you mm -hmm. got to, and uh, how, how did you celebrate that? Oh, well, I think there were many points during the path which uh, were like significant for us. Number one, the first path we needed to, uh, the first milestone was basically show that there is a market because they didn't believe in it. They thought maybe it's tiny, Yeah. right? And then the second one was show that this is an international market, not just Germany, Yeah. right? And then the third one was, okay, prove that this can become potentially uh, a, a profitable business that you can like, scale. And then the fourth one was basically kind of like also mixed with this, show that you can also create value through own brands, own production, to, ha to be not only an e-commerce company, but also like a portfolio of brands. Okay. Right? So each of those points were milestones for us. In hindsight, we should have probably celebrated much, much more than we did. Uh, I think at Navajo usually we tend to celebrate quite a bit. I think over the at the beginning you do that more, right? Mm -hmm. Especially when you're like young in uh, I don't know, in the university or just out of university, and everyone around you is also like this and doesn't have any time constraints. Naturally, you do that more at the beginning, and over time it tends to be uh, a little bit more grown up, like the company also. Uh, but it's actually a good point that you say it because now that I, in hindsight, we should probably always, always go crazy like the first days. Well, I guess that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah to the company, like um, I heard that there's a very flexible work culture, and yes. uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. what's so going on here? Okay, so um, what's going on here? Um, I think if you visit Navabi you will see that there are many, many great people, uh, many friendly people. And I think everyone that joins Navabi, the one thing that they always say is, oh wow, everyone is so friendly. Yeah, huh? And this is not, this is I think because of the people. Right? This, 
not so much what we did. Um, I guess we have a great HR team that hired also compassionate people. Um, so num number one thing, if you talk about culture and if you define culture as the way we do things, Nabavi does things in a very friendly way, yeah? which helps in your day to day. Um, we had experiment with many, many different types of structures. Uh, at the beginning, it was just the founding team doing everything, micromanaging everything. Then it became a little bit more hierarchical. Then we kind of broke it up. It became more holdocracy, teal structure, which basically means no team leaders. Everyone needs to own their own life. Take, take your life in your responsibility. Lead. Yeah? It's very extreme. And now we are somewhere between like, okay, this assumption, which is cool because your assumption is everyone wakes up in the morning and they want to do an excellent job. Yeah? Every human on this world, if you ask them, they want to do an excellent job. Yeah? If you, every human on this planet has a certain strength, like certain activities where, which makes them powerful, which give them strength, they love to do it, they become expert in those. Everyone has them, right? Sometimes people are not aware of what it is, or mostly people are not aware of what it is. But if you combine one, everyone wakes up and wants to do great work. Two, everyone actually can do great work if you define the work around their strength. Um, three, everyone wants to own their own life and be responsible for their own actions and not being told by someone else, like, do this now or do that or you're fired or whatever, right? Every human wants to own their own life. If you combine these three things, Holocracy makes a lot of sense, right? You basically say, I will, found, I will found a company where people will be responsible for their own life. I will empower them through putting them in the right positions and helping them to design their own job based on their strength, right? In theory, that is wonderful, yeah? Uh, many companies have tried some, especially in Holland, they're really, really su successful with it. Uh, I personally have witnessed that likely given where we are culturally, yeah, likely where we are in, the, in our market and industry, you need to have a mix between this and clear leadership. Mm -hmm. yeah? No matter how great this sounds in theory, many people still need guidance and leadership and they will feel lost if you just tell them, please lead the path. Right? Uh, some will love it, but it's difficult to build a company around this. Right? You it's difficult to hire for only leaders and no followers, right? Um, so we are right now in a kind of like transformation to, okay, we were in a very hierarchical, we went through holacracy, and now we're trying to build a structure where leadership is present and paves the path, but every single person can still own their own path, yeah? But getting the guidance. And for me, this is the most complex like, I don't know why in university they don't really teach this really good, right? Because it's like, okay, you have this human as a factor, this unknown variable, this variable he doesn't even know or she doesn't even know by themselves who they are, 100%. Yeah? In the morning, before lunch, they might be a different person than after lunch, maybe they're grumpy or not, yeah? So you have all these people and you have a customer, you have to now build a value chain that somehow makes, from a lot of people, create somehow a value which is it's equivalent of kind of like, kind of like if you look at the human body, we have many organs, uh, and it's kind of like, as a management, you have to replicate that. You need a living organism that for each organ works individually really good. Each one feels powerful, uh, but it also makes sense, right? And because you have the human variable where everyone is, it's impossible to define that variable, it makes this task, oh wow, what should we do, right? It's like a huge, huge, huge task. And for us, we are, we have made many mistakes and we are learning still. How can we actually build this structure uh, that actually works where people feel great in it because we don't want to have a company where people don't feel great. It's very, uh, we've seen many other founders where they, for them it's just about money. I want to have this exit now, right? Over time, and I think this is also an inspiration for our many founders want to make money, right? If I tell you, do you want to make a company that sells for a billion, everyone will say yes, yeah? But over time, one thing, this was also one of our reasons why we started, right? But over time you learn, hey, actually this money thing, 
there is this quote from Bob Marley. Yeah? I don't know. It makes a lot of sense in hindsight. Yeah. Bob <laughs> Marley's quote is: "Numbers are infinite. Money is numbers. So basically, if you run after money, you run indefinitely." Right? So in, in hindsight, when you are at a stage where you have made some money, you understand that making money is a part, but actually being happy and having a cool team that supports each other and you go to work and you love it, actually that should be your priority one. Right? So if you take this as priority one, and you want to build now a structure where in a capitalistic work world you still make money, it becomes super difficult. If you just want to say, hey, I want to make money, I think it's much easier. You can just build a hierarchy and say, okay, uh, I tell you where to go. If you don't make it, buy. Right? That's, that one still works nowadays, but with the new generation, and I think all of you guys, everyone is seeking like a meaningful workplace where they can become who they are and not like live in a dictatorship. So, uh, so we're not there. We're trying our best to get there. Yeah, it's a super difficult. Task. So there were some some um, some moments where we were like, okay, this is our actual system right now, mm -hmm. but I want to make this more workplace friendly, more mm -hmm. friendly in general. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's let's brainstorm how, how we can change that, or mm -hmm. is it more um, came out of itself and then? Mm -hmm. I think uh, one thing that we try to do, and this is, I think our number one um, value at Nababi. Uh, we try to also hire based on this, is um, strive to become your own best version. Yeah? And if you have this as value, you will do several things automatically. One is you will try to become always better. To become better in a very fast pace, you have only two options, in my view. Yeah? One is you have a really great mentor that tells you exactly what to do. Yeah? Most of us don't. Yeah? The second one is you have to run really fast and do a lot of test and try and learn. Yeah? So most founders, if they want to become better, they have to test and try and learn and make a lot of mistakes. To avoid the mistakes, there are again only two paths in my way, uh, in my view. One is you have to read a lot and experiment and test, or you go to a workshop and someone tells you or a mentor tells you what to do. Yeah? So if you really want to, if you have the, if you have the expectations to grow 100% every year, or more, you need to grow yourself 200%. You need to consume a lot of information and try a lot of things. Um, so at Navabi, we try this a lot, like try to read a lot, try to test a lot, try to talk to different people and brain some within the crew. Mm -hmm. but we don't expect that through working we will learn. Right? So the learning curve through just doing something without reading about it is really, really tiny. So these things, to answer your question in short, these things came majorly through reading and experimenting and not knowing if it's right or not. Yeah. Um, and this is, I think, the only way. The other way is you have someone telling you wha what to do. And in, for most founders, this doesn't exist. There has never been a company like yours with the people you have in the city that you are, you are with the culture that you have. It's impossible to tell someone. Yeah, especially when uh, there are so many different cultures uh, working. Yes, exactly, uh, exactly. And also, but this you have to be aware for your employees, and they can all witness. Uh, they can all tell you that it will feel like a lot of change, right? You're like, why are we changing things again? Why are we changing things again, right? And um, the reason is a startup is is uh, let's say it's an element. Let's just make it very simple. Yeah, let's say the. A company has three elements, a profitable company, yeah? And they have found these three working elements. And because of these three elements, they are profitable, yeah? And a startup is a company which hasn't found these three elements. So by nature, they have to change and put new ones in, yeah? Change and put new ones in. So by nature, a startup is just change, yeah? It has to be changed until you find your three elements that make you profitable and make you grow. So as long as you're aware, as long as you tell everyone, hey guys, we're doing it now like this, but maybe tomorrow we do it that way. Please don't be frustrated. This is the nature of us. Uh, adopt, adapt change, <coughs> live change. If you don't change, we won't make it. Sounds very agile. Yeah, yeah it sounds, but in, in, in theory, it sounds very agile, but in practice, it's very, very difficult. <laughs> I guess. Um, yeah, so then uh, now we got bigger and mm -hmm. bigger, and uh, I heard you got a 
also some spot, some head, some second headquarters in London or uh, second base? Ah, uh, yes, we have a London office, uh, and we have an office in Guangzhou, China. Um, <laughs> recently, we opened the office in Guangzhou, China. Uh, it's a side note. If you haven't been in China, please go. China will take over the world. <laughs> you should see who, who chi what China is. Yeah? Just side note. Um, but yeah, we have an office in the UK, we have an office in uh, China, and we have sometimes Monday morning meetings where everyone sits here and China and London can see us through this <laughs> little camera. The reason also why our company language is kind of like Danglish is because we have a lot of uh, English colleagues. Um, we have uh, some guys I think from Dubai, uh, Banu recently joined us. Um, many like from different places like if you live in if you work in Aachen you have to be open to the world to recruit for the needs that you have I used to that just there yeah. okay. <laughs> but yeah we have a lot of office in China yeah cool so um, I heard that the market in, in London and in France is especially interesting for uh, for your business uh, yes for us actually all markets so in general humans are getting bigger all of us Men and women are getting bigger, bigger, bigger. Uh, yes, so for us, it's like this is the one side, and the other side is, which is very interesting, is in, for our market, fashion designers do not like to produce bigger. Yeah? And up to very recently also, fashion designers did not want to accept that we're all getting bigger. So in their mind, we were all getting smaller. This is why they produced for size zero, but actually the world went up to size three. I think the average size is now 16. Like so, so during the time where the fashion designers went down with the sizes, we almost doubled, like or like 30 percent, 50 percent more in sizes. So our luck was that oh okay, the globally the market is getting bigger. Supply and competition is not that big because most people do not accept it. Um, so for us, yes, UK is very good, Germany is good, France is good, but every country in Europe is good. Almost every country in Asia is good. Almost every country in the Americas is good. There is almost there is hardly a country which is not good, which makes it also difficult for you, right? Because if you had only two countries, it would be very like laser sharp focused. And for us, it's always like like oh wow, how can we still be focused and not do like 50 countries at once and not do a single one right? Yeah, because I guess there's you're trying to uh, to go for a global market, mm -hmm. and you have so many different cultures, mm -hmm. and and you kind of have to adapt to, I guess even London has uh, mm -hmm. a very, or England has a very different approach to, mm -hmm. to marketing, to yes. how to, uh, wh what are the very useful channels for, for which group you want to advertise to. Exactly. Um, so uh, is there, um, like how do you keep track of the trends? And mm -hmm. uh, is there, yeah, a certain uh, mm. mixture which, which makes, makes it perfect? Or okay. Um, I don't think we figured it out 100%. Yeah. I would be lying if I tell you, like, this is the formula, please just do this. <laughs> In reality, I think one thing that we found useful is to hire people from that country. Uh, so we have some guys from UK, we have some guys that at least know of French and French culture. Um, this is very useful, right? Because it really, really significantly influences how you think and what you say. So I guess that's the one thing. You need to have people who actually understand the market fully before they actually work there in that country. But do you also use AI for, uh, yeah. for this kind of thing? Because I know Zalando yes. is trying to do that. Yes, yes. So um, uh, unfortunately, our CMO is not here. He hates it when someone says AI because he's, he thinks we are like at least 30 years from that point where you can actually use the word AI. Uh, so I know that there are some companies that are really, really at the edge of using data and trying to make it intelligent. I don't know of any that has really succeeded yeah, to make it really AI. Uh, most of it is more marketing than uh, reality. Um, it is true that we have a lot of data. Yeah? You will have a lot of data. And everyone then talks about big data. Uh, the problem with this is for most companies I know, at least for our size, and I think also for Zalando is, the more data you have, the harder it is to analyze it. Yeah? Because where do you focus on? Uh, what 
where do you dig deeper and what do you ignore? And I think we try our best to have like structures where people are responsible for providing the data, filtering the data, having reports and analysis, and based on that, try to optimize this and try to have some rule-based mm -hmm. recommendations, etc., and try at some point make it intelligent. Um, but I don't think we are there. I don't think I know any company that is there. Actually, with the more and more data that has, crea has been created, the focus of most has become even more blurry. More mainstream. More mainstream, well, the duck. <laughs> uh, more mainstream and even harder to make decisions, right? Because now you know from that customer everything. You know where she came from, where she was like 10 pages before she was on your site, all these 50,000 different channels she used before coming to you, but the other one used different channels and like, oh wow, where should I start? So I think right now we are in a phase, in the next few years, companies will be in a phase where you cannot talk about AI. It's, in my view, bullshit. Big data has to be reduced more to practic practical, usable data and meaningful data, right? Especially for an online business, the only way to talk to the customer is through the data, right? She's telling us something in the data in the form of data language, and we have to understand, oh, what are you actually saying? Which emotions is behind you buying or not buying 1.23 times more? Um, so, so it's more like clever <laughs> algorithms. Yes, I think, I think so. For us, it's more clever al algorithms. And I think as founders, for you guys, it will be very, very important to kind of focus and guide your team what to look at and what not to look at. And we found, for us at least, sometimes it's better to have small data instead of big data and simple analysis instead of super complicated analysis. Because people tend to go towards super difficult, crazy algorithms but then if you ask them the most simple thing, okay, but which, what kind of fashion does she like? They're like, oh, I don't know. I have to make a new algorithm in which maybe finds out something in 15 years, right? Uh, instead, you could have just asked her, given her three choices, and just focus on small data, have a conversation with her to understand or with many. So for us, I think we are, we, are, we and I think everyone else in retail is far away from AI. Um, it's more running around trends than really meaningful at this moment. You can do you can do nice things, but if you go to Zalando or wherever, if you just look at what they recommend you, it is not so artificially intelligent what that <laughs> thing recommends you, right? It's more like, no, I don't want that. Please leave me alone. <laughs> Maybe in a few years. We're trying our best. I think it's leading to this and telling us what to focus on and what not to focus on. Nice. Um, I think uh, we maybe want to do a little break. Mm -hmm. I guess you people have uh, some questions too. Cool. So break and then questions. Yeah. Okay, Let's cool. make a little like five to ten minutes something. Action. Ja, oder direkt ein Buch. Das reicht ja auch. Nein, das ist besser. 
Also ich, ich will jetzt erstmal stellen, dass ich die Wette habe, dass ich Schwachsinn bin. Ich weiß nicht, wie die Sachen so sind. Also okay, da habe ich ja ein gutes Wetter. Ich habe ja ein gutes Wetter. Ich habe ja ein
Meditation room, Ooh. and it got me, got me thinking. What is, uh, is there a special approach where you're like, okay, um, I want to uh, support um, personal careers and personal growth? I mean, you kind of said that, but mm -hmm. I want to hear more. Okay, okay cool. Um, so I think around two or three years ago, uh, Bachmann and me really went into this theme of meditation and mindfulness and yoga and all these things and over time at least for me personally it has become now a journey of like self finding myself and self-realization or however you want to call it and it has helped me personally at least to I think to be clearer to what I want and to be um, less influenced by my um, emotions hope, at least to some extent, and uh, Buddhists call it the ape mind. The ape mind is basically, it's a mind that never stops thinking, you know, like this little apes that you might see in, I don't know, vacation spots, they just jump around from everywhere, right? Exactly, right? And uh, it's just your stupid mind. And I think in our very noisy culture, we tend to never be clear. And I recently read something that kind of brought it to the point, which was, um, it's from this guy who wrote Homo Sapiens, you might know it, it's a very famous... Yuval? Uh, uh -huh. no, uh, Noah uh, Haraki or something. Yeah. He, he said something really, really cool. And he said, 
the first time I started meditating, I noticed that I cannot keep my mind focused for 10 seconds. Like my mind wanders off. And then I asked myself, if I cannot be clear for 10 seconds, how can I be clear in my life? Right? Very simple thing to say. If I cannot be focused and control myself for 30 seconds, how can I have a focused or clear day? So this was for him the finding and uh, for me like kind of like the what I try to get out of this. Um, and we have tried to bring it to our culture. So we had someone from Google here to teach us about mindfulness. Um, we've tried many things where there is a room there, um, but it's I so I think we're still pushing and pushing for it. It's still underutilized a bit, right? you know, because it's annoying to meditate. Uh, for most people, uh, some just believe it's just a spiritual thing and just for spiritual uh, hippies. Yeah? Uh, but if you go, for me personally, I think it should be something that you start teaching at elementary school and you don't stop until the last university year because it will make everyone's life so much easier and more clear. So we're trying to bring this to Navabi. We used to, uh, sometimes we still do, but we used to have, um, before we start a meeting, to have a one minute meditation break, right? So ba basically everyone just refocus, you know, calm down, focus on your breath, and then we start the meeting. And it used to be very, very productive because in this one minute where you focus your brain, okay, please stop thinking, please stop thinking, let me focus, your whole body calms down, your, your, your essence calms down, and you know much more, much better what you want. So we're trying to bring this to the world, but it doesn't, hasn't worked 100% yet. No, well, yeah, but you're, you're trying to implement it, mm -hmm. and uh, I guess that's a, that's a, that's a cool, cool thing to do. But um, so you, you kind of implemented it or tried to implement it. Teach us. So that's like six, seven years after you started the company. Yes, exactly. And we still need, I think it will be a journey towards becoming a mindful company, but we are really trying to go on this journey. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure out uh, what kind of um, traits you want to have as an as an entrepreneur, as mm -hmm. a, as a as someone who wants to build something up. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess a lot of people are interested in that too. It's like uh, because I guess this whole mindfulness mm -hmm. is really helping mm -hmm. now, but you kind of got into that pretty late. So at, the mm -hmm. at first you were super hectic, and mm -hmm. it was all happening so fast. You tried here, you tried there, and. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you say is your, um, yeah, I mean, everybody had this, this recept of, of success, but mm -hmm. uh, what would you say? What is yours? Um, re rephrase, rephrase this question for me, just so I, I get it more. Um, what would you say are the traits needed mm -hmm. to uh, be successful okay. in, as an entrepreneur? Um, okay, I think this one, if I would pick one, is uh, be willing to learn from make a lot of mistakes and be willing to learn from it. Um, I think this is the number one thing that as an entrepreneur you have. You have to try to fail a lot and try to learn from these failures a lot instead of giving up. Right? This is, I think, what entrepreneurs do. They fail and fail and fail and fail and then at some point they make it. Right? And um, I would say this is the number one thing. And this only works if you are passionate about something. If so that you, you didn't have like one topic where you were, I'm super passionate about oversized fashion. No, but this, this is a really good point. So it would be hypocrit hypocritical for me to say, all my life I wanted to create fashion for a plus size women. Right? This is not true. Right? But what is true is, all my life I wanted to create a great company where people w love to go to work and we create a product that is meaningful for our customers. And so this is 100% me. I can. Uh, this, I would love to create that. I haven't created it 100 percent yet, but I love this journey, and this gives me energy, indefinite energy. And uh, on this path, because I know I want to create a company where people love to go to work and create something, a meaningful product. I have I have the energy to make all these mistakes and go through the really really rough times. So we had times that, like I don't know. Like at the beginning, like the next day, we didn't know how to pay salaries, right? And this is like, whoo! Like if you have like the first couple of years, like it's very difficult times, you would probably, many people would just give up. But for us, it was like, okay, somehow we believe we're gonna get through this. We 
because we have this vision behind it. I got a, I got the idea that um, especially in the first years, even mm -hmm. like way before uh, Navabi, there was this um, uh, the people around you. Mm -hmm. They were like all all together. Everybody was kind of entrepreneurial mm -hmm. on his own way, and this more this guy more in the cinematic uh, or arty yes, yes. way the other one more super business and yes. uh, so i guess the your surroundings your your your, cho um, your choice of friends mm -hmm. is uh, a lot of uh, that too right mm -hmm. yes 100 percent. i think everything we did was because of the support we got from our our group kind of um, and that's that might be a very good advice also right? like the founding team right is probably the most crucial decision you can make. So Bahman and me, for the last 10 years, we've seen each other more than we have seen anyone else. Like his wife or my fiance, they don't get to see us a third of that time, right? So you are married, or I don't know, Ia and me, or Mathieu and me, we, have, we, we see each other, I don't know, 70% each day. Uh, you need to have really good people with you that support your vision or you have together this vision uh, otherwise, it will not work. It will feel like a drain, and then you have witnessed. Lo many people have witnessed. Like, if you don't have the right founding team, it's not going to work. So, probably the second advice next to have passion for something and be able to learn or fail a lot is find someone you really, really love to work with and have 100% tough love communication. It's very difficult. Like, without this, I, I wouldn't know who I would have done this with mess with these guys. But when you do, did you really go there and were like try to choose people who are also kind of the right mindset, uh, same mindset and mm -hmm. were also trying to be mm -hmm. building up something or were you like this is just how it is like other mm -hmm. people were gaming together and you guys just try to start companies together. We also game together all the time. <laughs> While we started the company I think the first few years we had here long nights with unreal tournaments etc. Nice. Just like um, but uh, I, I don't think it was a conscious choice. Mm -hmm. I think it was like, okay, we have many, we have a big group of friends and people that know each other. Out of these guys, certain group got this energy of, had the similar energy and they were attracted to each other to do business together. Yeah. Um, it, it kind of happened, maybe. Uh, maybe by choice or maybe just unconsciously through the energy. But it was not like I will just befriend these people because they also want to be entrepreneurs. I don't think that this will work. Yeah, exactly. So um, you kind of have to choose the uh, the people surrounding you. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you're you're not really able to choose. Yes. It kind of has to 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 grow on its own. Yes, very much. I remember during my MBA, I was part of this venture capital entrepreneurship team, and I was like, I remember like I was telling these guys, hey, let's just do something. Let's just it doesn't matter, just do it. And it just didn't work. You didn't like connect to that level yeah. as we did, as Bahman and me did, or these guys. Yeah. So probably also luck, in a way. I guess it's like always luck and being at the right place at the right time. Yeah, yeah. But one final question from me. What's there to come for the company? Nice. Uh, good question. Um, so... We are on a journey to become this mindful company. It will probably be a long path and we'll make a lot of mistakes. But I think our, our wish is that we will create one day a company where other companies will see it as an example to follow. Kind of become a role model of companies where they have combined love with capitalism. <laughs> it's very difficult. Uh, but this is something that drives me personally forward because it gives me energy. Um, so have these positive vibes and feelings, be friendly while still performing, right? This balance of friendship or friendly and performance is very difficult. Uh, this is from an emotional answer, and I think for Nababi, we are trying to become globally the number one in our niche. Uh, we are on a path, on a very good path there. Um, and on this, for me personally, I would love become my best version to create a team that is awesome. So this is kind of our, our dream so far. Great. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>
First question. Um, you talked about growing the first, and you talked about reading. So what was the most influential book to you? The most influential book? book influential you book I read. Yeah. Oh, wow. Ah, that's very difficult to say. OK, from you, your most favorite book? <laughs> the most favorite book, I think, in hindsight, yeah? Probably it wasn't the most influential from the first 10 years. But in hindsight, two things, in my view, yeah? Uh, that will likely help you no matter if you become an entrepreneur or not. And then I will give you an entrepreneur book also, yeah? <laughs> uh, number one is, I think anything you can learn about mindfulness will help you. No matter which path you will do, no matter if it's private or professional. If you understand to understand yourself better, it will definitely help you. And it will make your thoughts clearer, your intentions clearer, your energy much more focused. So I would recommend reading a book on mindfulness, meditation. Um, there is a really, really good book on that, but it's very difficult to follow. I think it's called A Mind Illuminated. It's, uh, it's a European professor who turned Buddhist and just tells you this is the way to do it. Like a step-by-step -step guide. Really good. Mm -hmm. Very difficult. Number one. Number two is, um, and it, I will tell you something, it might sound very off, yeah? But it's true, if you calculate, yeah? The, your brain and how you function, yeah? There are more connections between your neurons, yeah? And this is the off part. Then there are atoms in the whole universe, yeah? Okay, so now you might think, how is that possible? There's more in my brain than there is atoms in the whole universe. Not our galaxy, yeah? Nicht die Milchstraße, Milky Way. Mm -hmm. not, I mean all galaxies together, the atoms. And, yeah, it's like an indefinite number. There are more connections in your brain than in the universe. So I think part of this mindfulness part, the spiritual part, I think it would be good to know a bit about this tool that we all have in our brain up here. But no one ever educated us how to use it, right? It's actually quite stupid because when you drive a car, which is a very stupid tool, you have to have 20 hours of, I don't know, 18 hours or 30, I don't know, like driving license education, right? But for your brain, no one gives you ever a manual of how to use it. So I think really good to spiritually and kind of about your mind, read something about it before you start your journey. Um, as manager, I think there is a book, it's called uh, First Break, First break all the rules or something? First break all the rules, yeah? Really good book. Huh? Um, it kind of tells you a lot about strength-based management, about the most important things a manager needs to do. Um, for entrepreneurs, I think the book Principles by Ray Dalio is really good. He's a, he was a mentor of Bill Gates. It's also a big book. A lot of it you can skip. But uh, he, he has a whole part about his life that probably you don't want to read. Uh, maybe. It's interesting, but it's very good. You'll get bored at some point. Uh, that is a really good book. Otherwise, everything around management, entrepreneurship, all the great entrepreneurs ahead of us, those are the three I would recall. Sorry, I made three out of four. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Please. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to more details. What fashion industry? Because I think most of us are not fam familiar with fashion industry. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to know 80% of your salary from the company came from which section? Are you designing and mm -hmm. producing? Which mm -hmm. part mm -hmm. brings you more money? If it is, yeah. yeah. Yes, it's not good private. question. Fair enough. Uh, the second one, because uh, in these 10 years, how much time did you decide to close the company? Did it happen for you or not? <laughs> How many times did I decide? For example, think uh, about closing the company. Yeah. For example, ah. you wanted to close the company <laughs> or change away. <laughs> it's a really good. So both of them are not these questions. Yeah. I wish I would knew the answer to that ten years ago. Um, so to your first question, um, having your own brand, you will always make more money, right? Because you basically skip the middleman whoever sells you a brand. Yeah? In some industries, you're lucky enough to be able to sell your own brands. Yeah? That will make more money. 
in other industries, no one will buy your own brands because they are meaningless, right? So if I tell you now luxury fashion, yeah, and I tell you, okay, will you buy Louis Vuitton or, I don't know, Lucas, sorry, yeah? <laughs> just, just as an example, yeah? You will likely say, mm, if I wear Louis Vuitton, my friends will think this and this of, of me and I will feel like that man and I will be willing to pay 1,000 euro for this scarf, yeah? Whereas Lucas might at that moment not have enough money to brand for you, to you what it means, yeah? So depending on the industry, you are either lucky and can do home brands, yeah? Um, or it is, will be very, very difficult for you to build own brands. But for us, the more own brands we have, the more lucrative the whole business is. Yeah? But it's very difficult to shift between third-party brands and own brands, okay? And does this answer your question? Uh, just a little more, uh, I think it's uh, Yeah? Uh, I mean that, for example, you are designing, you are producing product, yeah? Also, like yes. that. But we also which buy and sell. And, and you have your own brand. Yeah. yeah. Which uh, section helps you to get, I mean, for mm -hmm. example, 80% of your company salary is uh, from designing or no. from... At this moment, not. At this moment, it's like a third is from our own and two-thirds is from outside. Like what we buy and sell yeah, as a typical retailer. But we're trying to shift to more and more own brands. So make this one third to 50 to 70%. That will make more profits, yeah? But the money that we get right now, the revenues are primarily coming through what we buy and sell. Yeah, yeah? what other people produce. Yeah? Right. And to your second question, uh, how many times have I thought about closing the company? The, the first question, uh, you mean that uh, something like distributor, yeah? Mm -hmm. Something like that, you mean? Buying from mm -hmm. other brands and... Mm -hmm. This is what we do. This is what e-commerce Zalando does, right? They like when they when you buy Zalando something is Nike or Adidas or I don't know, Boss, they yeah, buy yeah. and they sell those brands. Yeah? Perfect. Okay. To your second question, uh, I, I think this is what I, what I meant also try to say earlier is as an entrepreneur there will be many 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 times where you think this is not working or I don't have the energy to do it or I just fell down and I cannot get up anymore. Right? And um, I think this is the part also of entrepreneurship and passion. If you don't pick something where you are willing to get up every single time, and these thoughts might come on a daily basis, yeah? You, or on a weekly or month, they will come, yeah? And it depends how, so this is, let's say, the negative energy, yeah? Depending on how big your positive energy is and the drive that you have, uh, you might succumb to it much earlier, which is why very important that you have this passion for something. Otherwise, as an entrepreneur, you won't give up, right? So, uh, so to give an example, the great Michael Jordan, uh, he always said, I never lost a game, I just ran out of time, right? So having this attitude of, I will win no matter what, because this is something I love, this you will need, because you will think every day or every week or every month about not doing it, because it's so, so, so difficult to organize a group of people into a structure which is happy and fun, but still performs to create value. And many times it's easier to just go and work for someone else. You just you come home and uh, that's it. You don't need to think anymore. Does, guess, this, does this answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. And I guess the people supporting you. Yes, 100%. I think without the people, you don't. I personally did not need to start. Right? It, it was like this. Uh, Everything was built on the giant of shoul uh, off the shoulders of giants, right? You don't do anything by yourself. You're just one part of the project. Yeah. Uh, where do you see the advantages and disadvantages of having your office in Aachen? So ah. I would expect a lot of companies, <laughs> e-commerce, <laughs> they won't stay yeah. in Aachen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, What's your reason for the future, maybe? So you want to grow more point. in China or London? Or good, point, good point. So in the, first, first, in the first few years, every VC told us you have to move out of Aachen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but luckily for us, we already knew that these VCs, they don't always give the best advice, right? <laughs> because it was th them that told us don't even start, right? Uh, I think it's pros and cons, and I don't think there is a right or wrong, right? So in, in Berlin, we might find people much quicker, but these people might also leave much quicker, yeah? 
Um, I see as an advantage in Aachen, is we grew up here, our network is here, we love mm -hmm. Aachen, people will feel that we love Aachen. Yeah? This is an advantage. Um, two, people who come from around the world to come and work for you in Aachen, they are much more invested in this company than someone that just jumps from company to company in a different in a business in Berlin. Yeah? But of course, the other side is it doesn't always have the most uh, super skilled for your area, like people you need, or you just need to look further outside of Aachen. So, as I said, I have people from we have people from Dubai, we have people from all over the world, um, from London. They they just chose to come to our company because they like it. So this advantage is the time to recruit is a bit more difficult. Having said that, there is this uh, poster that our HR put in there. It's called <laughs> Refer a Friend. <laughs> and if you help our HR recruit one of the people that we are currently hiring, you will get uh, 1,500 euros. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so this is the advantage of this. Uh, we talked a lot about the history and also a lot about the learning uh, from the body. Um, if you are now going to look more into the future, um, is there something that you can see that Navadi needs to get right in order to stay <laughs> meaningful? It's a very hard question for the uh, wow. to answer, right? But <laughs> <laughs> One thing or several things? Um, it could be several things, but so in the span of one to three years, maybe. <laughs> Um, yes, um, I think for us, yeah, if you talk about so in a detailed, short term, let's say one year, two years perspective, there are really functional things that we are trying to do, and one of them is the own brands thing that we just discussed. Yeah? But this is just for from a financial point of view. If we want to stand on our own feet, uh, you need to create more value and more profits and give less. Yeah? This is from a pure financial view. I will tell you, okay, own brands is the one thing that we need to do. Yeah? Uh, from a management perspective, building this organism, which kind of is like a human, and having the balance between friendliness and performance, this is something that we need to get right, otherwise the organism doesn't function. Uh, this is super difficult, but a lot of fun, in my view. Um, feel like a doctor a little bit. Um, so I think this is what we need to get right, like to, to make the structure fit the strategy in the culture, which is like super difficult in my view. Uh, those are the two things I would say. Um, I think we should continue hiring great people. In my view, we have now the greatest team we have ever had in the last 10 years. We've made a lot of, lot of mistakes with recruiting. And I think this is something that if you want to read about something, read about recruiting. Um, it's the most difficult thing. I think the founders of Google always said the first 50 people that they hired, they had really slow, but they wanted to make sure these are the best 50 people, both emotionally as well as functionally. Yeah, so for us, another challenge is to grow and hire great people that fit into our culture in Aachen. Does this answer your question? Yes. Okay, cool. Thank you. Felix? Um, yeah. First of all, uh, thanks a lot for the talk. That was very inspiring. Spot on, Bobby. I would like to speak into one of your statements about China, just out of curiosity, because we're also in the manufacturing business, so it's a little bit of more electronics. Okay, cool. So, um, and I have to say I disagree. Uh, so I, I'd like to um, understand a bit why you say um, China is conquering the world. Wow. <laughs> Um, I've been there now a couple of, a few times with friends, and um, so if you walk around Shanghai or Guangzhou or Shenzhen, yeah? so first of all, Guangzhou and Shenzhen, these are cities probably some of you have it, never heard of. Yeah? Each one of them is bigger than the biggest city in Europe. Yeah? I think twice the size of the biggest city in Europe. Yeah? In each one of them, the middle class is gigantic. Yeah? If you go through Shanghai, the main shopping street, you will find more Louis Vuitton stores than in, I don't know, maybe half of Europe. Yeah? 
in one city, in one street. Yeah? And all of them are super full. Yeah? And these people who are in there are Chinese. They're not Europeans. Yeah? So you see a lot of uh, monetary power, which has been very, very under the radar, at least for me. Yeah? Because I always thought, okay, China, we're in Europe, we are so far ahead. And then you try to go and buy some uh, obst, like some fruits, and the grandma says, where is your mobile pay? I don't accept cash or credit card, right? <laughs> and then you're like, okay, wow. Then you go through the grocery store and people pay through face recognition. They don't even, it's handless, right? So it's like, okay, uh, what are we sure we know on which track these guys are? Because their development track seems to be on a whole nother level than what I see when I go here to Aachen or when I go to Berlin. So one, two is the sheer amount of people, yeah? It is, what is it, 1.45 billion, yeah? What is that, like four times Europe? Something like this, yeah? So you have a nation four times the size of Europe on a super technological path where the middle class is very strong and has a lot of money to invest. Now you put this formula together and kind of is wow. So we should probably all tell our children to learn Chinese if they <laughs> ever want to like have okay, like I think every third person on this planet is either Chinese or Indian. Yeah. Right? So as a small Germany with seventy million or eighty million, eighty three, four million people, it will be difficult to compete with a high tech, super fast learning, super controlled, hierarchical, efficient, super powerful and rich nation. This is why I said, I think they're just at the start, you know, in the next 10 years, they will be on a whole nother level. When the grandma already now asked me about mobile pay, and I'm like, oh, well, I don't have anything, so. I, I, get, I, get, I get your argument, if you have a figure, like, because there's a lot of sentiment against China, or mm -hmm. from China, in terms of their manufacturing for low, co low labor costs, etc. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, that's a little, like, it's low level. So what, what you're, you're referring to is more the general um, wealth knowledge, power that they're building, so there's another idea behind mm -hmm. getting getting past everyone else. Yes, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank mm -hmm. you. <laughs> Please. Um, <coughs> it has become clear that it is very hard to build a successful company like yours. So uh, what do you think has to be done or should be changed to make it a bit easier for future founders no matter what, education, yeah. regulation, consulting, yeah. whatever, what, what thing is? I think uh, if I would recommend one thing to this region, Aachen, is uh, money. So <laughs> the reason is, if you go to Silicon Valley or if you go to China even more, um, every entrepreneur or many entrepreneurs will get money for ideas. Yeah? Because there are many, many VCs around universities, yeah? around Stanford, around MIT. Um, there are many, many VCs just giving young <coughs> entrepreneurs money. Yeah. And this means these people can make millions to make, uh, can lose millions to make learnings. Yeah? So if you think about Bachmann and me, we have basically, they invested over 30 million in our learnings. Yeah? If we wouldn't have made these learnings, we cannot, I cannot sit here and tell you my learnings. Right? And the more money, the more learnings, the higher the chance of successful big companies. And in Aachen, there, I, I don't even know if there is a one big VC. There's Capnemic in Cologne, and they are even relatively tiny, right? So basically what we need here, we have the greatest universities, probably Europe-wide for many areas, but there's not much money to experiment and fail and learn a lot. Unfortunately, all of us, we cannot do much. And if you go to the city of Aachen, they will start some kind of regulation process that will take 100 years. Uh, so I think if I would recommend one thing is money, um, that would be the one thing. The other thing is have a great idea that no matter where you are, VCs from a different country will invest in you, which kind of help help Bachmann and me that basically all our investors are from far, far, far away from Aachen. Yeah, so if you work on something, work on something really, really risky that has the potential to change a lot of people's lives so that people might invest in you here in Aachen also. Yeah, I would add to that uh, that you need more private money. 
I have also my experiences with, with official money and no, uh, development funding and so on from, from the government. Yes. Uh, but it takes so much more effort to manage official money. Yes. Uh, it's like so much quicker, uh, especially the learning. Yes, exactly. um, If you get the private, uh, get from the private sector. Yeah, yeah fully agreed. I think in America there is nothing like public. Nothing. Public funding. No. So when I was in San Francisco, I got I had the feeling the money is lying in the streets. Yeah, <laughs> I have a good it friend. Is. He had a really bad idea, and he just got ten million. How is it possible? <laughs> idea is not. You don't even have an idea. <laughs> you don't even have a PowerPoint slide. Yeah. Oh, but you got the right investor at the right yeah. time. You could you could sell good and. Yeah. He made his mistakes. Yeah, I have the same experience there. But I mean, it's this is something outside of your control, right? Now you can sit and say, hey, we don't have money. But I guess what you as entrepreneurs can do is like, just build a great team, have a great product, and go and get the money. There are many, many places nowadays, like Noah in Berlin and London, where you can meet. You can just write them. They will answer. If your idea is good, they will write you back. And based on your experience as entrepreneur in which range of age, it's better to establish a startup. Oh well, I, I, I think and I'm underqualified to answer this answer uh, to answer your question properly. Um, so I don't think it has to do anything with age, in my view. Because uh, there are many. If you look at all these guys, Jeff Bezos, what was he? 45 when he started, 50 when he started Amazon. Uh, I know a very good person. His name is Pejman Nozak. He invested in uh, Dropbox mm -hmm. and Facebook or something. And uh, he was like, he was a carpet seller up to the year of 50. Right? And now he has founded Peer VC in Silicon Valley with 100 million under his fund. Uh, but I also know some people who, like us, are much younger and it's easier to fail, right? Mm -hmm. But if you have the right passion, it probably doesn't matter at which age it is, right? You can, you can argue both ways. You can say when you're older, you might have put some money on the side to be able to risk it for six months, right? That's one thing. But you could also say, oh, but you have more responsibilities, you have children, blah, blah, blah. That's a con argument, contra argument. But you could also, as a young person, argue, oh, you can do take a lot of risk, just go crazy and fail a lot, right? That's a pro argument. The con argument is you have no idea about the world, you have no idea about management, you have no idea about anything. Right, so it's difficult to say age behind it. I think the age is when you found your passion, that's the age, no matter what age you are. But Jack must say 40 years old is the end of the site, end of the age for founding yes. a company, but if you take a race... Um, it's a very Chinese uh, way of thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> 40 years, not older. Right? I've told you, Jeff Bezos. What he is 40? He was older than 40 then. Oh, no. Baba? Was he? Okay. No, he was younger. Yes, then. That's, okay. that's why he's there. <laughs> Two questions, if allowed. Um, first one is uh, when you talk about mindfulness and company culture, how mu uh, important is eco consciousness and sustainability? Sorry. <laughs> in the production of your own mm -hmm. labels? Very good, good question. So I guess it's, the answer is a one million percent important. Yeah? Um, especially when you produce in China, there are all these thoughts about, oh, is this child labor, blah, 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 but it's, that used to be probably 20 years ago. Nowadays, they're probably even more modern than what we do here. Um, I think it's very important. I think the customer wants it. More and more customers want to buy something nachhaltig. Um, I think the industry, including us, is too slow to adapt to it. Um, but it is, I think it's the only way out looking at all the consequences <coughs> or all the results from global warming, etc. Right? So we need to do it. We are just all way too slow to adapt to it. Our t luckily, if you have a cool team like ours, they are very aware of it. So no matter what you do, they ask, is this eco-friendly, is this sustainable? Right? So it's super important. Um, companies like us, we are on it, we would never do something consciously against it. But it is difficult to run 1,000 kilometers speed, try to, if, so diff different. It's difficult to run fast and not do mistakes. 
So, and I think it's stuff like Nachhaltigkeit sometimes get lost in translation in this one. But the good thing is we are aware of it. Well, transparency is still a problem with production companies perhaps? Yes, because if you're a retailer, it's very difficult to find out if you buy it from someone, where did they pr produce, right? Yeah. And they can tell you any story, but if you have 100 brands, now you need to hire a detective kind of <laughs> that goes into and researches each one's production facilities. And as a young company, you cannot afford it, right? So you need to kind of just trust them that they do the right thing. Ask them, try to establish like how much Siegel right, licenses. But it's not easy to to really do it 100%. But you should try. And the second, I'm just curious, um, do you ever plan to expand in menswear? <laughs> ah, uh, good question. Uh, some of our competitors have. Uh, for us, it's uh, n uh, no, not now, not in the near future. The reason is we could expand to every country in the whole globe, first with women, and I think men, women are uh, much more shopping friendly than men. <laughs> yeah? I guess men are easier to satisfy, um, they would just accept whatever, Not the return rates wouldn't be so high, probably, uh, but for now we just really focus on women, try to understand these women, we've become really good at understanding women, so I think we should <laughs> stick to that. <laughs> Just have one sentence to explain what the best thing is to, uh, to uh, the best things? Uh, what do you do? I think it's not a what, it's the who. Yeah? <laughs> I think the best thing is other people. I think we have a really, really cool team. It's full of compassion, it's full of heart. Everyone works 300%. Everyone likely is super underpaid and works too much. Yeah. Um, but I think it's it's really the people. Uh, many people will tell you this, maybe as an answer. Yeah. Uh, but I think for us, if you stay here for a week or a month, you will feel the warmth and the love of many, many people, and you cannot buy that with any money. Right. So it's the people. So we're coming. Oh, there's another question. <laughs> Yeah, um, actually, I'm um, interested to know um, what's actually your advice for the young entrepreneurs planning to start a business. Okay, cool. Um, take something that can change the world, or a big chunk of it. Yeah. So think really, really big before you think small. Yeah. Because many say go to this niche, right? No, don't go to the niche. First, yeah. Maybe you end up in a niche, but start big. Uh, take something that is really, really risky. Yeah. Because we know that success and risk. Nowadays, at least, is very correlated. So basically, the more risk you plan into your business model, the likelier you will make it big. Yeah? So this is something that is also counterintuitive because if you go to a bank, they will tell you in this business model how did you mitigate the risks, right? And I'm telling you, please put in a lot of risk in there. So big bets. Um, those already two, I think, two advice. Find a good. Find good people you love to work with that every day when you wake up, you want to be with this person just like he or she would be your wife. Mm -hmm. yeah? um, that's the third one that is very important. And probably do something that you really, really love. Right? So for us, it was not the love for plus size fashion, but it was the love of building a great company where people love to come to work and just, just be entrepreneurs. It's kind of drives us. If you do this for and are terrorizing VCs, with pitch decks, um, they will probably see that you know someone should invest in. Mm. And the last question, um, Steve Jobs actually said, um, "Leave every day as if it was your last, because one day it will be." What's actually your point? Do you, what do you think about that? Oh, very good sentence. I wish there is a very similar thing someone uh, says. It's like I think every morning when you wake up, do you smile? If not, think about it. Two million people did not wake up today. So this alone is the reason to smile, right? So it's kind of it's similar, mm -hmm. right? 100% agree. This also where this mindfulness part really plays along. Like live in the moment, enjoy the presence, enjoy the uh, enjoy this, right? 100% agree. It's very difficult to follow because of our monkey mind. Bit, huh? But I wish I would do it much, much more. Okay. Great.
thanks for being with us. Thanks for having us. And Thank you. Thank you. And eating or yeah. Okay, cool. It's your, it's your coffee. Guys, there's still some food, I think. Yeah? Also beer also, I think. Yeah? Das ist nicht vom also, ihr könnt gehen, wenn ihr wollt, aber es geht jetzt darum, jetzt networking. Einfach die anderen Leute kennenlernen, euch und einander austauschen. Schöne Fotos machen. Gut, ich muss jetzt los. Wenn wir Eltern besuchen. Wenn euch das sehen, machen wir ja kein Networking. Haha, very funny. Wenn wir Eltern besuchen, ich muss raus. Brauchst du Hilfe?